This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Some 7,000 people in a migrant caravan heading to the United States were dispersed by Mexican authorities this weekend as they approached Mexico City. Some of those seeking asylum told Human Rights Watch they'd sought protection in Mexico, but were dissuaded from seeking refugee status and were pressured to accept voluntary returns to their home countries. Many are from Central America, Venezuela and Haiti. Some had children with them. Here in the United States, President Biden wrapped up the Summit of the Americas Friday in Los Angeles by unveiling a new plan to address migration in the Western Hemisphere that includes a series of so-called bold actions. This is Biden. Coming together to launch the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection. With this declaration, we're transforming our approach to managing migration in the Americas. Each of us, each of us is signing up to commitments that recognizes the challenges we all share and the responsibility that impacts on all of our nations. The Los Angeles Declaration is built around four core pillars. First, stability and assistance, making sure communities that are welcoming refugees can afford to care for them, to educate them in their education, medical care, shelter, and job opportunities. Second, increasing pathways for legal migration throughout the region, as well as protections for refugees. Third, working together to implement a more humane and coordinated border management systems. And finally, making sure we're working together to respond to emergencies. The agreement was signed by over a dozen countries in the region, including Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras, even though their presidents did not attend the summit. The only Central American country that refused to sign was Nicaragua, which was excluded from the gathering by the Biden administration, along with Cuba and Venezuela. The plan includes a commitment from the United States to resettle 20,000 refugees over the next two years, even as authorities say more than 200,000 migrants, asylum seekers and refugees approach the southern U.S. border each month. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, reports a record 234,000 migrants and asylum seekers arrived at the U.S.-Mexico border in April alone. More than a quarter of the world's migrants are in the Americas, some 73 million people, even though the hemisphere accounts for only 12 percent of the world's population. This according to the International Organization for Migration. Millions are displaced in their own countries by poverty and violence. For more, we spend the hour with Juan Gonzalez, Democracy Now! co-host, journalist, professor at Rutgers University, longtime broadcast and investigative journalist. On Tuesday, he releases this new revised edition of his landmark book, Harvest of Empire, History of Latinos in America, originally published in 2001, already a best-selling book and required reading in hundreds of colleges and high school courses. Juan, congratulations on the reissue of your book. Um, it's great to spend the hour with you, not as co-host, but as the primary guest of today's show, with this epic work uh, that you have added so much to in this latest edition, beginning on the issue of migration and how the U.S. treats migrants, asylum seekers, refugees on the southern border. Juan, take it from there. Yes, Amy, thanks uh, for the opportunity to go a little bit in depth into this uh, new edition of the book, as well as to remind folks about what was in the uh, earlier versions. Uh, I think the, um, the biggest thing that we have to understand is that this country has been grappling with what to do about immigration policy now for about 30 years and has been not been able to come up with a refashioned immigration system in the United States. Uh, and, and every few years and every administration promises that they're going to do something about uh, a, an orderly flow of migrants into the country. But the reality is that there's resistance and a huge battle uh, over what, how migration will be governed in the 21st century, because we're really talking about 
who gets to be an American uh, in the 21st century. So it really is a an issue of the uh, who can legally come into the country and have an opportunity to be a citizen and a, a voter. And and I think that what's happened is that. Uh, we really have not come to grips with, as the title of my book says, The Harvest of Empire, that the reason there are so many uh, Latinos and people from Latin America coming into the United States is that uh, the, the Latin America was the start of the American empire. It was where the first overseas colonies of the United States uh, uh, came into existence. It's where the United States constantly was intervening with its military forces, where most of the major multinational companies uh, uh, began to grow, companies like uh, the United Fruit Company uh, and, and others. Uh, the, uh, Latin America was the incubator of the American uh, empire. Uh, and so we are in a position, and we have been now for decades and decades since really the end of World War II, uh, we're in the same position that the French are in regards to North Africans, that the British are in relationship to their former colonial empires of uh, India and Pakistan and uh, Jamaica, and, and that the Germans are in, in their tiny empire that they developed toward the end of the 19th century in the in the Middle East that 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 uh, all of these former colonial powers are trying to figure out what to do about the fact that so many people from their former colonies have come to the metropolis and that is the the fundamental issue that all of these western countries are facing the actual change in the composition of their countries and when it comes to Latin Americans, it's astounding. I, I started writing this book in the 90s, and I even have been astounded by the continued growth of the Latino population of the United States. So the latest census says that there are 62 million Latinos in the United States, the 2020 census. Uh, that's about 18.7% of the population. But even the Census Bureau acknowledged that that's an undercount, that they undercounted about 3 million more Latinos uh, uh, that they should have counted. It was the largest undercount of any group in, in the census. And that doesn't count the 3.2 million uh, people in Puerto Rico, uh, which is not considered part of the United States, but is under the U.S. flag. So if you add the 3 million from Puerto Rico and the 3 million undercount, you're talking about 70 million people of Latin American descent under the U.S. flag. That's about one in every five people in the entire country. Uh, so this increased. Uh, and when you look at the young people, that's where the real st stunner is. California is about 40 percent Latino. But the public schools of California are 54 percent Latino today. <laughs> the public schools of Texas are 52 percent Latino today. The public schools of Arizona are 45 percent Latino today. When you go into the even the southern states uh, in Georgia, the Latino population is 10 percent, but the population of the public schools is 16 percent uh, uh, in, uh, in North Carolina. Uh, it's 18 percent, the Latino public school population. This is the future of the country. And so I don't think that we really have yet grasped how the impact, the unintended harvest of the American empire is coming to, to roost right here uh, uh, in our own country. And that's why the political leaders are having so much trouble trying to figure out how to develop a comprehensive immigration and humane immigration policy. So, Juan, you begin your book by saying, in June 2018, media reports revealed U.S. Border Patrol agents had detained hundreds of Latino children inside chain-link cages at a warehouse in the southern Texas border city of McAllen. The disturbing images of terrified toddlers wailing for their parents provoke the worldwide condemnation. I just want to play that audio. Just a few seconds of it that ProPublica released. <laughs> that crying rocked the world and at the time exposed the Trump administration policy. Yeah, you know, zero. Um, uh, 
the the policy uh, of um, zero tolerance. Yet we are under the Biden administration. Talk about what happened then and what has changed. Well, there has been some uh, slight changes of the uh, Biden administration, especially in the uh, 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 the attempt by the Trump administration to shut down legal immigration or or, or asylum. Uh, there's been some changes in there, but the problem is that there still is no framework, legal framework for dealing with the, the uh, migration situation today. And, and we're not talking just about the issue of undocumented versus document, documented workers. We're talking about uh, visas for guest workers. We're talking about uh, asylum numbers, which the United States should rightfully increase uh, substantially uh, its uh, the numbers that it permits of, of uh, asylum uh, or refugees into the country, uh, so that uh, we don't have a, uh, a a a clear framework to deal with the current conditions of migration uh, uh, in the hemisphere and in the world. But I think the even worse part of it, and this is where in my updated edition, because again, uh, my last edition came out in 2011, so this really deals with all of the changes, and there are many changes that have occurred in the Latino experience in America over the last uh, 10 years. It updates those. Let me just give you one, um, one startling fact that I came across in doing my new research, right? In 1998, Two-thirds of all f arrests by federal government agencies in the United States were of U.S. citizens in 1998. Two-thirds were of U.S. citizens. Twenty years later, in 2018, two-thirds of all the arrests uh, of federal agencies in, the, uh, in our country were of non-citizens. The entire federal law enforcement bureaucracy has been turned into a persecution operation for non-citizens. In 2018 alone, the federal government arrested more Mexicans than it did American citizens. They arrested more Mexicans than they did American citizens. That's an extraordinary change in the operation of the federal government. Uh, the budgets, the U.S. in uh, fiscal year 2021 spent $26 billion in immigration enforcement, in the budgets of uh, ICE and of uh, Customs and Border, uh, in border uh, Enforcement, $26 billion. That's more money than is spent in all its other federal law enforcement agencies. Uh, the DEA, the FBI, uh, the ATF, the U.S. Marshal Service, and the Secret Service. All of those agencies spent less money than did Customs and, and Border Enforcement and, uh, uh, and ICE. So the entire federal government apparatus has been turned over the last 10, 15 years into an apparatus hunting down, deporting, uh, locking up uh, immigrants. And we're not just talking about undocumented, because there are all of the people who were uh, legally in the United States, but then were at some time or other convicted of what the government called aggravated felonies and then were deported. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, so there is a there is a repression and deportation machine that has developed at the federal level against, uh, and they're mostly people from Latin America. Here's another startling uh, fact uh, that I came across in my research. Between 2010 and 2017, the United States deported 1.5 million people who, had, who were either legally in the United States or undocumented and they were convicted of a crime or, or an aggravated felony. And by aggravated felony, we're talking about almost anything, a DUI under the uh, Clinton ref uh, uh, Penal code reforms uh, was an aggravated felony. 1.5 million people deported. Of those people, 93% came from only four countries Mexico, 
Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. 93% of the 1.5 million people deported came from four countries. <laughs> the rest of the world uh, was the other 7%, even though people from those four countries only represented about a third of all the non-citizens in the U.S. That's racial profiling. How do you come up with 93% of all the people you, you deport because they committed a crime come from only four countries? Uh, the entire apparatus is geared to kicking out Latin Americans. Uh, and uh, no one is doing anything about it. And you have this summit of the Americas right now, Juan, uh, where all sorts of controversies, widely considered a failed summit, where uh, the president's spokesperson says uh, he won't meet with autocrats, won't meet with Nicaragua, Venezuela and Cuba, ends up, what's his big meeting uh, in um, Los Angeles? With Bolsonaro with the autocratic ruler of Brazil, who's already preparing, and now the Brazilian military is preparing, to say that the elections there will not be legitimate. And, Juan, by the way, there's this breaking news that's coming out of Brazil right now. We have been reporting on the indigenous advocate and journalist um, who have uh, been missing in Brazil. Well, Reuters just broke this um, information that the bodies of the British journalist Dom Phillips and indigenous expert for Bruno Pereira, who'd been missing for more than a week in Brazil's Amazon jungle, were found Monday. This is according to Philip's wife, Alessandra Sampao. Um, so he meets with, uh, with Bolsonaro um, and Mexico, as you're talking about, uh, AMLO, Andres Manuel López Obrador, refuses to attend because of the U.S. imposing who can come to the summit of the Americas and who can't. Also, El Salvador, Honduras, Bolivia, um, n none of those countries and Guatemala come, other uh, presidents come either. Yes, well, I think that this Summit of the Americas is really uh, the complete failure of the uh, Biden administration to be able to show a united front uh, uh, in Latin America. It's really, um, it's really a reflection of what has changed uh, geopolitically in Latin America. And in my new edition, I uh, uh, touch on that somewhat, which is that uh, Latin America is no longer the U.S. backyard. It used to be. <laughs> it used to be during the days of uh, Teddy Roosevelt and gun, uh, gunboat diplomacy and even into the 1930s and 40s and even uh, in the 60s with President Kennedy and the Alliance for Progress. But Latin America has changed dramatically. Uh, and, uh, and one of the big changes, of course, has been the rise of popular movements outside of the established uh, uh, political uh, structures that long reigned in these countries and uh, and the uh, movements of indigenous people and and marginalized uh, people in these societies and the working class in this society. But the other big change has been the rise of China uh, as a major force uh, in Latin America. Uh, while the United States was off fighting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and trying to maintain uh, uh, oil supplies uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, it, and dealing with Syria, and uh, China was investing in infrastructure in Latin America, building huge multi-billion dollar dams and, uh, and tunnels and, and ports. Uh, and providing low interest loans to many Latin American governments. And so these governments no longer feel they have to do what the United States says. Uh, and increasingly, uh, the, uh, the region uh, is no longer a region dominated by one power. Uh, and as a result, now many of these governments feel that they can reject loans from the United States or demands of the World Bank, uh, because there's an alternative source of funding. Now, of course, China has its own uh, its own desires in terms of its uh, 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 
grabbing hold of, of future sources of raw materials. But, it, uh, but the Chinese aid does not come with all of the military threats and all of the insistence that things be done China's way that the United States has practiced for so long in Latin America. So as a result now, uh, there's room to maneuver among the, uh, the, uh, the leaders of the Latin American countries. And you're seeing it happen. You saw it happen at the Summit of the Americas last week. That's right. And you have this, uh, The Hill reporting China, which by now has held three China-Latin America ministerial forums at the level of foreign ministers, has called out the United States for discriminating among Latin American countries, pointing out Washington is stuck in a Cold War mindset. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and we're seeing it now, for instance, in, uh, in uh, Venezuela. We had the—, the, the uh, uh, the ridiculous situation that the um, uh, Washington still recognizes Juan Guaido, uh, the uh, opposition leader uh, uh, in Venezuela, as the legitimate uh, his legitimate president of Venezuela. When the reality is that for several years now, it's been clear that whatever criticisms there may be of uh, Maduro as the president of Venezuela, and there are many. Uh, that uh, the uh, Venezuelan opposition is so fractured and and so uh, impotent that it has no capacity uh, or ability to uh, run Venezuelan society. Uh, and yet, uh, and of course, the United States now, because of the war in Ukraine, is even trying to uh, create new uh, new chances for negotiations with Maduro in Venezuela in order to uh, secure. Uh, more oil supplies uh, for the uh, for the U.S. Well, not for the U.S. so much, but certainly for uh, Western Europe because of the uh, the Ukraine of uh, the war in Ukraine. In your new introduction, you talk about the use of the term Latinx. Yes. Well, uh, as um, uh, as we know, in, in our democracy now, we use the term uh, quite often. Latinx has been. Uh, has increasingly grown as a uh, as a term to define the people of Latin American uh, population here in the United States. Uh, and uh, but the, the reality is that uh, a, two a 2019 poll shows that only three percent of all Latinos used the term that year, and only 23 percent had even heard of it. Uh, and they. Uh, there was a similar battle that arose some years back, uh, more than a decade ago, over whether it was more appropriate to use the term Latino or Hispanic. Uh, and uh, I took the position then that I thought that these discussions about the most appropriate term were more uh, debates among uh, the intellectual class than they were among the masses of the people. The masses of the people generally refer to themselves by whatever nationality uh, uh, their parents were. And, uh, uh, and of course, in the, in, the, uh, in the case of indigenous people, uh, by their own uh, native heritage. Uh, and uh, the reality, though, is that uh, both Latino and Hispanic, uh, I began to use interchangeably. And of course, uh, uh, given that uh, Latinx uh, addresses the, the gender uh, uh, binary, that I thought that it was, it's definitely a, uh, a, a welcome term to use. But I continue to use them, inter all three of them, interchangeably. And in fact, um, uh, I say in, the, uh, in that introduction, I just wanted to see if I can find it for a second to explain. Uh, and um, I say, moreover, most migrants from Latin America still prefer to identify themselves by their particular country of origin, or in the cases of indigenous peoples, by their native heritage. Their U.S. born and raised children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren will increasingly adopt different views. Ethnic identity, after all, is a social construct much like racial identity. It requires a dynamic and fluid approach, not a static and rigid one, with every generation free to reimagine and redefine its own place in society. Uh, though the actual economic and social conditions of any community should always take precedence over 
labels and intellectual descriptions. And that's the, uh, so I use all three terms, uh, Latinx, Latino, and Hispanic interchangeably. Uh, uh, none of them are precise and accurate. All of them are acceptable to, in my perspective. And the most important thing is not the term or the label. It is understanding the class and uh, and racial and social condition of the masses of the people and how uh, they can improve their lot uh, in society. Juan, you also um, have new information about, well, about culture and how um, Latinos, Latinas, Latinx people are portrayed in this country. And you Refer to Lynn Manuel Miranda. Now, last night were the Tony Awards, and the Latinx actor, composer, writer Lynn Manuel Miranda um, honored Stephen Sondheim. He, but I want to go to him at the Tonys in 2016, because June 12, Sunday, marked the sixth anniversary of the 2016 Pulse nightclub mass shooting in Florida where 49 people were killed. Pulse was an LGBTQ plus club, most of the shooting victims Latinx. Lin-Manuel Miranda delivered a sonnet about the Orlando attacks at those 2016 Tony Awards. His Broadway hit Hamilton had won 11 Tony Awards that year. This is Lin-Manuel. When senseless acts of tragedy remind us that nothing here is promised, not one day, the show is proof that history remembers. We live through times when hate and fear seem stronger. We rise and fall and light from dying embers, remembrances that hope and love last longer. And love is 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 love cannot be killed or swept aside. I sing Vanessa's symphony. Eliza tells her story. Now fill the world with music, love, and pride. Thank you so much for this. That was Lynn manuel Miranda in 2016, also spoke last night at the Tony Awards. Juan, talk about how Latinos, Latinas, Latinx people are portrayed in the media, uh, in culture, in movies, in shaping uh, the perspective of this, the largest minority community in the United States. Yes, well, I mean, there's— um, uh there's no doubt that probably the largest uh, impact uh, that Latinos have had in the country is in the realm of culture, whether it is in uh, in uh, in, mu in the music that we listen to, in the books that we read, in the case of Lin Manuel, in his uh, almost single-handedly beginning to revolutionize uh, the American theater, uh, and I think that uh, uh, that this sudden infusion, you know, I. I, I uh, I often say that Lin-Manuel Miranda is probably the biggest um, uh, jobs producer for African-Americans and Latinos in theater uh, in the history uh, of the United States, because all of, uh, because his two, uh, uh, his two uh, seminal works, uh, In the Heights and Hamilton, uh, as they are uh, produced in regional theaters around the country end up employing huge numbers of of actors in uh, in all in all of these places and often for long runs uh, so uh, he's become a jobs creator uh, just at, because of the popularity of those two shows and the impact that it's had on the class composition of theater goers uh, is uh, is phenomenal uh, uh, not to mention the fact that he's almost helped to revolutionize how you teach American history uh, uh, to uh, to public school children. Uh, so I think that, uh, but Lin Manuel is just one of many uh, young uh, performers and artists that are really transforming uh, American culture because, to the degree that. Uh, Latinos become more a part of the society, and intermarriage occurs between. Uh, you know, Venezuelans and uh, and Cubans uh, marrying in uh, in uh, Miami, and their children have this new Latino identity, whether it's Salvadorans or Mexicans in uh, in Los Angeles or Puerto Ricans and Dominicans in New York. The intermarriage and the and the amalgamation of these uh, various Latino cultures, and then Latinos also marrying and intermarrying with African Americans and white Americans, you're creating a whole new amalgamated culture in America. 
uh, and with a with a strong uh, uh, Latinx uh, infusion that I think is uh, enriching the culture and, and diversifying uh, the culture in ways that we really haven't grasped yet. Uh, and but I think Lin Manuel is probably the uh, the prime example of someone who uh, is leading the transformation of American culture. Juan, I wanted to go back to a clip of the 2012 documentary based on your book, Harvest of Empire, that talks about the history of uh, U.S. imperialism in Latin America. In this clip, the involvement of the U.S. in the Dominican Republic, where many of the immigrants here in New York City hail from, the clip prominently features the Dominican-born Pulitzer Prize-winning author Juno Diaz. The American nation cannot, must not, and will not permit the establishment of another communist government in the Western Hemisphere. I'm here because the United States invaded my country in 1965, an illegal invasion, completely trumped up excuse to invade the Dominican Republic and crush our democratic hopes. We've lived the consequences of that illegal invasion, politically, economically, and in the bodies of the people who were wounded, in the bodies of the people who were killed. We've been living it for over 40 years. There have been two major U.S. occupations of the Dominican Republic. The first was in 1916. The U.S. Army trained a new Dominican National Guard. It handpicked a former railway security officer, Rafael Trujillo, to lead that guard. And Trujillo then uses the power of the military to seize control of the government. He was like the most horrific imagination of this terrifying dictator. He would disappear Dominican and American citizens and kill them with impunity. He basically ruled the Dominican Republic for 30 years with absolute, total control. He routinely kidnapped and assaulted the wives, even of his supporters. And throughout his career, made it extremely easy for American companies to do business in the Dominican Republic but was a savage, savage dictator. Eventually, even the United States government could not stomach his methods of operation, so the CIA joined with disgruntled military officers to back his assassination. For the first time in 30 years, the people of the Dominican Republic are breathing the sweet air of liberty, and the streets are jammed in celebration. Dominican Republic, um, last in 1965, from the 2012 documentary based on Juan González's book, Harvest of Empire, which was directed by Peter Goetzels and Eduardo López. But I want to also go to a second clip. Um, this features the indigenous Guatemalan Nobel Peace Prize-winning Rigoberto Menchu. Guatemala fue tremendo. Guatemala was unbelievable. 200,000 dead that we have accounted for, 50,000 disappeared. 83 percent of the disappeared and executed were Mayas. I left Guatemala after they burned my father alive in the embassy of Spain. They were asking for political asylum from the Spanish government. They were trying to save their lives by entering the embassy. But at that moment, the Guatemalan security forces attacked the embassy. Los quemaron vivos. 
They burned everyone alive. A todos. Realmente no one survived. De los campesinos, de los Not the students, de la gente no one who was allí. there. If what exists in Guatemala is persecution, murder, killing, if what you have is insecurity, Yo prefiero romper la frontera then I prefer to cross the border and go to a place with more security. That was the Nobel Peace Prize winning indigenous leader Rigoberta Menchu. Juan, we have about three minutes left from Dominican Republic to Guatemala to El Salvador to Honduras. Um, take us out with this history that so few people in this country understand. You know, I think it's 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 especially instructive uh, seeing this clip on the Dominican Republic because that's that's an invasion, a U.S. invasion that most Americans uh, don't know about or never taught about, but yet was critical in the shaping of that nation. It was actually the second U.S. invasion of the Dominican Republic. There was one in the early 20th century. But I think it's especially instructive uh, since we're now in the period when everyone is concerned about the war in Ukraine. What was happening in the Dominican Republic was that leaders had come to power, were trying to overthrow a military dictatorship, and the United States perceived them to be allying with another bloc, as, as President Johnson said, the communist bloc. Uh, and, uh, and that was seen as a threat, even though the Dominican Republic itself was no threat to the United States. And repeatedly, our troops have gone into Latin America to overthrow governments or to stop uh, uh, popular revolutions only because we didn't like what, those, what was happening there, not because those countries were a threat. And yet here we are criticizing Russia for daring to invade Ukraine because uh, it has, uh, its leadership has, uh, wants to be closer to another bloc, to the West. Uh, and uh, the same logic that w our country has used over and over and over again throughout its, uh, his the history of Latin America. Uh, and I think it's instructive for us to understand that this great power imperialism uh, has really was trademarked and, uh, uh, and uh, established, the model was established in Latin America by the United States. And that's why, as I say in my book, this is the unintended harvest of the empire. The empire expected just to take resources and wealth. It never expected so many of the people of these countries it was exploiting to come to the metropolis. Uh, and uh, that's why we need to fashion an immigration system that, under, that takes into account that history, uh, the wealth inequality that we have fostered and the violence and, uh, that, and the arms that we have supplied to those countries uh, and uh, try to fashion a more humane uh, immigration policy for the future uh, uh, in the United States.